Six candidates battle it out to become the UK's next Prime Minister and lead Britain out of the European Union. How will they deal with the issue that brought down Theresa May and divided the country? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, the race to become Britain's ex Prime Minister is well underway, with six men in the running to lead the governing Conservative Party. By July, one of them will replace Theresa May. She's stepping down after Parliament refused to back her deal to take the UK out of the European Union. Brexit dominated the candidates' first televised debate, but as Emma Hayward reports, the front runner didn't even show up. In the end, it was a show without its leading man, with no sign of Boris Johnson, the front-runner in the UK leadership contest. His absence at this first televised debate glaringly obvious, leaving the rest of the candidates to state why they should become the next Conservative Party leader and, by default, UK Prime Minister, and with the opportunity to take a swipe at an absent Johnson. Where is Boris? If his team won't allow him out to debate with five pretty friendly colleagues. Uh, how's he going to fare with 27 European countries? The conundrum that is Brexit and what to do about it, of course, dominated the debate. I argued for Brexit right from the beginning. I led the Leave campaign. I will deliver Brexit. A responsible prime minister would prepare for no deal. And I think if we prepare po properly, which we haven't done for three years, that it will actually bring on a deal, and that's the best way to end this uncertainty, and to actually have that deal. This leadership contest is an issue of trust, and I'm the only one, I believe, who can be trusted to get us out by the end of October. Morning, Mr Johnson. In the first ballot of this contest, Boris Johnson, Britain's former foreign minister, secured 114 votes from his party's MPs. His nearest rival received just 43. Johnson defended his refusal to take part in the debate by saying he was staying away because the public had had enough of party infighting. Theresa May got the top job back in 2016 when her final rival withdrew from the leadership race. Some called it a coronation. Contenders in this latest battle are determined that won't happen again, saying the path won't be cleared for Boris Johnson to get the keys to Downing Street. They are not going to get a different deal out of Europe. We all know that. Whoever does win will have to do what Theresa May failed to do and deliver Britain's exit from the EU. Rarely, though, in Conservative leadership contests does the front-runner actually win. If we were talking about a wider vote where the public were involved, then maybe you, know, you would see people like Rory Stewart, who did win the room today. I think he would have a bit more popular support. Uh, I don't think he has that much support when it comes to party members who are very much, um, kind of, I think, in Boris's camp. The prospective leaders will hope they'll have done enough to win more votes ahead of the next ballot on Tuesday. Despite his absence here, some still feel the leadership is Boris Johnson's to win or throw away. Emma Haywood, Al Jazeera, in London. All right, time to introduce our panel now. In London, we have John Johnston, political correspondent at Politics Home. In Brussels, we have Stephen Erlanger, chief diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. And in Lancaster, that's in northwest England, we have Mark Garnett, senior lecturer in British politics at Lancaster University. Welcome to you all. Uh, but, John, let me start with you. First of all, what did you make of the debate? Many commentators uh, seem to think that the debate was won by Rory Stewart, who, of course, came last uh, when it came to the first ballot. Well, the most notable thing about the debate last night was the absence of the frontrunner, Boris Johnson, who was empty chaired. They left a, an empty podium for him last night because he decided not to do these debates. He's been uh, absent from, from most of the public events around the Tory leadership contest. There was a discussion, a, a hustings held today by um, members of the UK Parliamentary Press Gallery. This is a group of reporters who have access to the House of Commons. Again, all of the candidates showed up, uh, apart from Mr Johnson. He's entirely absent at the moment. 
Um, but yes, the, one of the, the standout uh, winners, I think, from last night was Rory Stewart. As you said, he has come from nowhere. Nobody really expected him to run, let alone to make it through the first ballot. Um, and he's really brought a, a kind of energy and a new way of doing uh, political campaigning for these leadership elections. His, his campaign looks like it could run on and on if he's able to get the votes of MPs tomorrow. Ah, that's the point, isn't it, Mark? Because, of course, no matter how well Rory Stewart did in this debate, uh, even though Boris Johnson has been uh, defined by his absence pretty much in this whole process, uh, he's still got an unassailable lead, hasn't he? Boris Johnson is winning by a huge margin. Well, he certainly secured a very comfortable win on the first ballot, but... Mr Johnson is a very divisive character. You either love him or you loathe him. And I think that for him to really be a serious candidate at all in this election, given the rather colourful past he has and some of the blotches on his record, I think that it means that MPs will have decided to swallow their misgivings about him. Now, I think then on the first ballot, what you've seen then is only 114 MPs, or 113 plus Mr Johnson himself, who've been willing to do that. And the argument for them doing that is, of course, that he's seen as an election winner. So I think the first round, although his team, I think, were content with it, it wasn't overwhelming. And I think that in terms of Mr Stewart, I think Mr Stewart is an extremely irritating factor in this um, leadership election in the eyes of MPs, because the job of any uh, Remain candidate, somebody who has accepted the results of the referendum but clearly would like to, uh, soft Brexit and clearly knows a lot about the subject, but the, that person's role was really to be slaughtered in the first round. Mr Stewart has defied that role. Now, he only just got through the first round, but even so, he's still there. And as John was saying, he's certainly making a very lively impression, but he doesn't fit the script. Right. He's an irritant, and I think that MPs would be delighted if he doesn't get through the next round, but maybe he will defy the odds again. All right, Mark, just uh, very briefly, if you will, just explain for us what the next stage of the process is, because, of course, uh, the next British Prime Minister is not going to be elected by Britain's people. It's going to be elected by members of the Conservative Party who are, what, mm. aged roughly 57 years old, overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. Well, there's a process now, a series of different of votes uh, in which the list of candidates is whittled down to two. The two most popular who emerge from this uh, contest will then go on a series of events around the country and they'll basically be trying to get the votes of Conservative members. As you say, this is a party whose youth wing once had many times more members than the whole party now has. The youth wing, I believe, was about one million members at one, uh, half a million members at one point. So it's a, a party which you would argue is not a particularly good photo fit with the British people as a whole. Uh, so there'll be a series of votes. But, uh, candidates will not only be eliminated, the one that comes last in each uh, ballot is eliminated, but others will probably reconsider and drop out. And then uh, eventually we'll be left with just two standing and then it's for the vote of the party members to decide out in the country. All right. So coming to you now, Stephen, uh, of this uh, group of six uh, men, which do you think, if any, would the steering committee on Brexit at the EU prefer to deal with? Of course, they'll have already had some, uh, something to do with Dominic Raab, a former Brexit secretary, um, with Boris Johnson, of course, a former foreign secretary, and indeed Jeremy Hunt, the current uh, foreign secretary. Well, I would have to say um, they don't like Dominic Raab very much. They don't think he was a very good representative of the job he was supposed to be doing. Um, as foreign secretary, they found Boris Johnson amusing, creative, not very serious. Um, I think what they really want is a leader who can command a majority for something in the House of Commons. That's what they need. I mean, the EU deals with governments. Um, governments are led by people, to be sure. But I don't think they really care all that much as long as whoever it is really can command a majority in the House, give a clear direction, get Brexit resolved one way or another, and ideally pass this withdrawal agreement and set out on negotiations about a future relationship. And they're willing to deal with anyone who's capable 
of commanding that majority. John, and, and one uh, quick note. I read that uh, Dominic Raab was known as the turnip in Brussels, apparently some play on, on his name in Dutch. But uh, coming to you now, John, what are the positions of the candidates in terms of this withdrawal agreement, which, according to Europe, is non-negotiable, it's there, it's set in stone? How are any of them going to persuade Parliament to pass this deal when Theresa May tried and tried and tried and failed? Well, that's really the key question. Most of them have, have essentially said that they will renegotiate parts of the, the agreement. Boris Johnson has said that, but really hasn't set out any detail on how he would do that. Um, Dominic Raab and uh, Mr Johnson have both put a firm date, uh, the current uh, exit date of October 31st. They have said, we will leave on that date, deal or no deal. But what they have not been clear on is if Parliament moves to block a no deal, which seems incredibly likely, what they will then do. Will they call a general election and go back to the people and ask for them to be given a majority so that they can get a new deal through Parliament? Or there has been here in the UK a real row brewing because there has been some suggestion that Mr Rabb or Mr Johnson, if they become Prime Minister, could suspend Parliament, essentially shut down Parliament, lock the doors, stop MPs from coming in to block a no-deal Brexit until we hit that October 31st date uh, when legally we would leave. Now, this has caused a major uh, row here with MPs who have said that that would be unconstitutional and that some Tory MPs have said they would vote to bring down their own government if that was uh, the case. So we're in, we're in really uncharted waters, aren't we? Mark, let's come to you again, because this, this idea of suspending Parliament, proroguing uh, Parliament, I think is the uh, official uh, term, uh, and, and, and forcing through an issue, I mean, how unprecedented is that? Uh, has it happened before? Well, certainly in, uh, in circumstances of this kind, it's completely unprecedented in what, what one might call the democratic era. It's a kind of device that absolute monarchs, uh, people like Charles I, who did without Parliament for 11 whole years, having prorogued it, people like that uh, were very happy to use this device to shut Parliament up. So it really would be a desperate ploy. And uh, I, I just think that it would be very difficult for any leader who went ahead with this policy. It'd be, any, it'd be very difficult for that person ever to recover any credibility as a champion of democracy. It is that serious. And, uh, Stephen, given that, um, uh, as you say, the, the main prerequisite for any British Prime Minister is the ability to command Parliament, uh, and we, we don't seem to, to be uh, terribly confident uh, with regard to any of the six candidates, um, is Europe, will Europe, uh, the European negotiators in particular, be persuaded uh, to come back to the negotiating table? Because many of of the candidates have suggested that there is room for renegotiation. Is that at all possible? Well, there certainly is possibility for renegotiating the non-binding political declaration which declares what both sides want for their future relationship. Now, to be honest, the withdrawal agreement already is going to have to change because the original date of March 29th for Britain leaving is passed, which means the numbers in the withdrawal agreement have to change anyway, because Britain is still in the EU, so still needs to pay in to the budget and so on and so on. So there's going to have to be some talking around the edges. The real problem, as, as we've all been around around, is the so-called backstop on the northern Irish Irish border. Now, that has been a problem. I don't see uh, the European Union bending on that. that. That is a guarantee. It's not anything anybody wants. Um, and I, I do believe that's a big sticking point. Now, there may be ways to, you know, talk about timing and phasing and so on and so on. But the essence of the withdrawal agreement, which is a divorce deal, I mean, it's not the future relationship, really. I, I don't think can change very much, if at all, and certainly not in the sense of, oh, I'm just going to come to Brussels and they're going to bend and we're going to get whatever we want and 
in three weeks. The other problem, it must be said, is given the way the law is written now, Britain leaves on October 31st if it does nothing. Britain will have to ask for a delay beyond October 31st if it wants one. And whether Parliament wants it or not, um, unless it does something active, if, unless it passes a law preventing the withdrawal, that's going to happen on October 31st. And there are some people in Brussels, the French in particular, who think it's enough with this, that maybe October 31st should be the final deadline, whether in the end Britain wants that or not. And, uh, John, coming back to you, uh, covering Westminster, um, how many of these candidates then are uh, trying to assuage the concerns of the the hard Brexiteers within the party uh, and promising almost a, a rather casual approach to a no-deal uh, uh, departure from the European Union. We know that Boris Johnson has certainly talked that up. Certainly, and this is the problem that he has created for himself because he has made these promises to hardline Brexiteers who have now fallen in line behind him uh, with this very firm pledge that he will take the UK out on October 31st. Now, some of them have already started to threaten that should that not happen, then they would possibly think about defecting to Nigel Farage's Brexit party, uh, which, of course, pulled off a stunning victory in the European Parliament elections last month. So we are going to end up in a very difficult position for those MPs if this date doesn't pass. And it's possible that we go into a general election where, with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister saying... Parliament has blocked Brexit, uh, there's nothing I could do about it, and now I need you to give me um, a majority that allows me to force this through. Uh, but he, he's really put himself in a difficult position. He's tied his hands uh, on this date, and, and it seems almost impossible that Parliament will allow this to happen. All right. Um, uh, coming back to you, Stephen, in Brussels, because... Um... Uh, John uh, referred to the recent uh, European elections, of course, which saw a tremendous showing for the Brexit Party in the UK, as well as for other uh, nationalist and populist parties around Europe. How has this changed uh, politics, this changed complexion of the European Parliament? Is that uh, changing uh, any particular attitude towards uh, the British dilemma? I don't think yet. I mean, the new Parliament comes in early next month. Um, it is true that nationalist populists, which were about 20% of the old parliament, are now about 25%. And obviously the Brexit party, the sort of British MEPs, will go as soon as Brexit happens. So they're likely not to affect European politics very, very much. But if they're obstreperous and noisy, it may increase the desire of some in Brussels to be done with this no matter what and have Britain leave. The other thing, it just really is worth saying that even if Britain leaves without a deal, it, which we keep saying, they're going to have to be back in Brussels quite soon anyway to negotiate all kinds of things that were covered in the withdrawal agreement, like landing rights and citizens' rights and all these things that seem to have been settled but obviously would not be settled at all in a no-deal Brexit. And, uh, Mark, in Lancaster, uh, some people claim that the current situation that Britain is in is pretty much a consequence of a, a, an internal uh, division, a kind of a civil war almost within the Conservative Party that has taken, what, the best part of 30 years. It's seen at least three, if not four, prime ministers fall on the basis of attitude to Europe. Is that accurate? Yes, um, Margaret Thatcher, uh, certainly you can trace her. The, uh, there are lots of other reasons for her departure, but the immediate cause of the challenge to her leadership was a disagreement about Europe. John Major's life was made impossible by Europe. You've had in the in interim, uh, William Hague uh, struggled to make an impact because of his attempt to be a kind of a compromise Eurosceptic. Ian Duncan Smith had trouble partly because he was obviously an advanced Eurosceptic and then Mr Cameron has fallen too. So, um, yes, I mean, it, it really is a running sore and it really originates from Margaret Thatcher herself with her Bruce speech of 1988, which really validated the views of people who wanted to leave the European, at that point it was the European communities. Uh, and from then on, it's almost like people who want to be true to Mrs Thatcher's legacy 
have had a conflict of loyalty. They're more, more loyal to Mrs Thatcher's memory and the anti-European cause than they are to the party. And this is all now coming to a head. You now have members of the party fairly openly saying they voted for the Brexit party in the recent European elections. And this is yet another problem for Mr Johnson. People will defect to the Brexit party if he's not hardline enough. People will defect possibly to the Liberal Democrats if he's too hardline. So he's wanted this particular role for a very long time. But I think it's very difficult to see how he's going to enjoy it, uh, certainly enjoy it for very long. He may not even be in that role for very long. As long as he's in it, it won't be very enjoyable. Right. So, Mark, it sounds very much as though the very future of the Conservative Party is at stake or certainly is, uh, com is, is uh, connected deeply, intricately connected to the machinations concerning Brexit. We're in a context where in the past, certainly in the early post-war period in Britain, uh, loyalties, voters were very loyal to parties, almost like they're now loyal to football teams. Now, I would suggest that that um, analogy doesn't really operate anymore. People are much more inclined to regard political parties on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. So generally, political parties are losing deep-rooted loyalty. For the Conservative Party, it always traded on being a party of stability, that you could trust it in a crisis. Well, that particular brand has been pretty well contaminated, and the brand has been contaminated in other ways for reasons well documented being called at times the nasty party. A nasty divided party in the present context does not have a future in my view. Mr Johnson is going to have to pull off a miracle, and as I say, I think he's probably the last of these candidates to have a chance of bringing that party back together again. So he may win votes for the party, but he won't win a happy future for this party. All right. And, John, um, very quickly, if you would, just take us through uh, some of the other candidates, because it is important to mention that there are six. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Boris Johnson, Dominic Raab. What about Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, who uh, was seen is a very firm Brexiteer, isn't he? He was seen as somebody who could really stand up uh, not only to Jeremy Corbyn, but also to the leaders of Europe. What's happened to his campaign? Well, he was obviously partners in crime with Boris Johnson during the, the Leave campaign, but then was uh, kind of muddied his, his brand a little bit with Tory voters in the last leadership election where he essentially knifed Boris Johnson during that campaign. He was now, he's now been seen as being very loyal to Mrs May's deal, which is hated by Brexiteers. That has damaged his standing amongst the more Eurosceptic elements of the party. And now his campaign is really fighting for life because of um, revelations about drug use from his past. So he, he's not really been able to break through. He can't stand up as the kind of top Brexiteer against Boris Johnson. And now the rest of his campaign has slightly been derailed by these personal revelations. And, John, 30 seconds on Sajid Javid, who's the outsider, if you like. He's the only non-white one, the only uh, uh, man with working-class uh, origins, son of a bus driver. Tell us very quickly about him. Well, Mr Javid, yeah, he, he's standing as a, kind of saying he's one of... Uh, he's standing against the elite... Um, Within, the, within society, of course, worth remembering that he was a senior figure in a bank and made many millions during that role. But yes, you're right, he has certainly come from a very different background from the rest of the candidates, uh, and he's putting that forward um, as part of his message for not only how he would deal with the immediate, the next 15 days of Brexit, but how that would um, impact his leadership for the next three or four years into the, the future general... All election. Right. But it, again, it seems difficult. Brexit is... It's all about Brexit right now. All right, John, thank you. And I'm going to give the final word to Stephen, because you're in Brussels. You're perhaps where it really, really matters. Um, how are uh, those in Brussels viewing the shenanigans going on uh, in the UK? Well, with a lot of sadness, Britain matters to Europe, and Europe matters to Britain. And, and, and Britain and Europe do enormous trade together. Britain's important militarily. Um, it's committed to the security of the entire continent. It's a big actor in NATO. It's a nuclear power. It's a member of the UN Security Council. Everyone wants Britain to figure it out. And when they figure it out, to come to Brussels and get a deal that seems good to both sides. That's really what people want. They don't want a bad relationship. Right, OK. Gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. John Johnston, Stephen Erlanger... 
Mark Garnett, thank you all very much. And as ever, thank you for watching the programme. You can see it again any time you like by going to the website, aljazeera.com. Should you want more discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's the Twitter sphere, of course. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis. From me and the whole team here in Doha, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>